Lectures from the Academy. Welcome. My name is Chrissy Dawn, and for the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you a lecture from the Blue Heron Academy entitled The Poor in Your Midst. This presentation is one of a series of lectures selected from the many classes taught by Dr. Gregory T. Lawton to the students of the Blue Heron Academy of Healing Arts and Sciences from 1980 to 2022. Dr. Lawton founded the Blue Heron Academy in 1980 as a free school for women in transition who were victims and survivors of rape, incest, and domestic assault. Since that year, thousands of students have learned the practice of true traditional health care at the Academy and have gone on to establish practices serving the health care needs of their patients. Dr. Lawton is a licensed chiropractor, napropath, and acupuncturist, as well as a certified naturopath. In this podcast, we will hear stories about patients who, having been misdiagnosed or mistreated by the medical profession, found compassion and healing through holistic health care. The Poor in Your Midst In the stories to follow, I'm going to discuss my treatment of patients where I felt that the patient had been subjected to enough pain and suffering. They had already paid too much money for the wrong diagnosis or no diagnosis, or they had been subjected to an ineffective or harmful medical treatment. These patients needed help, not another medical bill. During my practice of holistic health care, I defined several core principles that became the foundational values and ethics of my practice of health care. The first principle was not to charge for the care of children. Consider the words of Jesus when he said, Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come to me. The next principle that I adopted was to treat everyone, regardless of whether they could pay for their care or not. From the Baha'i writings of Baha'u'llah, we find this statement. The poor in your midst are my trust. Guard ye my trust, and be not intent only on your own ease. I also adopted the policy not to charge patients with very serious, debilitating, and disabling diseases, or a terminal condition. Again, from the Baha'i writings, we find this guidance. Be the source of consolation to every sad one. Assist every weak one. Be helpful to every indigent one. Care for every sick one. Be the cause of glorification to every lowly one. And shelter those who are overshadowed by fear. When I was in college pursuing my first doctorate, I was taught to load patients up with a long list of supplements and nutraceuticals. But when I entered private practice in a rural community during an economic recession, I quickly learned that this was a financial burden that many of my patients could not afford. After observing this, I proceeded to teach myself how to help patients with simple foods and herbs that cost very little. I remember a patient that I treated at no charge simply because she had not received a competent diagnosis or effective treatment from numerous doctors. She was a nurse that worked at a local hospital. Her name was Nancy. I was just beginning to establish my practice in Ludington, Michigan. Because of the state's history of threatening holistic practitioners with legal action and imprisonment, I was initially suspicious of her phone call to set up an appointment. Why was a nurse calling me? when she had an entire hospital of medical doctors available to her. Nancy told me that she was having some issues with her tongue and suffering from chronic fatigue and asked for a consult. She showed up for her appointment, and after we chatted about the weather and trivial small-town news, I asked her what was going on with her tongue. She shared with me that her tongue condition had stumped all the doctors in Ludington Memorial Hospital. Nancy had showed her tongue to every doctor she saw, and none of them could give her an answer as to what was going on. I asked her what was wrong with her tongue, and she promptly stuck it out at me. There it was then. She had a geographic tongue. Her tongue was lined with raised ridges and looked like a map of Africa. In general, a geographic tongue can be caused by several different conditions, but a classical geographic tongue can be a vitamin 2 or riboflavin deficiency. A deficiency of other vitamins, such as B12, biotin, or folic acid, can also produce a geographic appearance on the tongue. 
Nancy had a classical geographic tongue with a B vitamin deficiency. If her medical physicians had had more than two or three hours of nutritional training, they would have known that. I asked her to put her tongue away, and we talked briefly about her medical history. Nancy had been placed on several courses of antibiotics for recurrent bladder infections. Her daily diet was typical. She was following the standard American diet, or SAD diet as it is known, and she loved her vodka martinis, perhaps a bit too much. These are all lifestyle behaviors that can contribute to a deficiency of B-complex vitamins. I pulled out my clinical nutrition textbook, and I showed her a picture of a tongue just like hers, a geographic tongue from a riboflavin deficiency. I wrote out a recommendation for a liquid B-complex vitamin formula that I liked, and she headed off to the local health food store to purchase it. Within the month, Nancy reported that the map of Africa was no longer on her tongue. I met my next patient, whose story I want to share with you, at a friend's family gathering. Ed was in his late fifties, and he worked as a tow truck driver. We struck up a casual conversation, and once Ed found out what I did for a living, he asked me if I would be willing to help him with a health problem. I said yes if I could, and Ed began to explain to me a lifetime problem with dry skin and very cracked, bleeding, and painful hands. Ed suffered terribly from this condition during the winter when his dry, cracked, and bleeding hands got worse, and the cold winter air made his condition even more painful. Ed shared with me that at night, he spread Vaseline over his hands and put on rubber gloves. This procedure did not seem to make any difference, but he did not know what else to do. Ed had been seeing doctors for his condition since he was a teenager, and currently was under the care of a dermatologist who was recommending standard anti-inflammatory medications and topical ointments, creams, and lotions. This doctor was one of dozens that Ed had consulted with over 30 years. Ed stated that he had spent a fortune on doctor's bills, but none of them had helped him. I reasoned that Ed had spent enough money on doctors, and it was time that someone told him what was wrong and how to fix it. So, I did. I asked Ed, When you eat fatty foods, what happens? Ed's immediate response was, I must run straight to the bathroom and I have bad diarrhea. Ed's answer confirmed my diagnosis. Ed had a condition called steatorrhea, an intolerance to fats in food resulting in a malabsorption of fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A. Vitamin A is critical for proper skin growth and repair. I recommended that Ed get and take a form of dry vitamin A that is readily absorbable and easily assimilated into the body. I also recommended vegetables high in beta-carotene and zinc. Over a period of a few weeks, Ed's hands healed and his dry skin was almost gone. Ed was very happy, but I imagined that the doctors that he had been supporting were not. I'd like to tell you about a young mother and father who asked to consult with me about their son, Jason, who was experiencing recurrent inner ear infections. The mother related to me that during the last winter, they had spent over $2,000 on ENT office visits and medication, and now the doctor was recommending an expensive procedure to insert ear tubes into Jason's ear canal. The family did not have medical insurance so all the office visits and medications were out-of-pocket expenses. Sally was a stay-at-home mom caring for her three children, and Franklin, her husband, was the sole financial support for the family. Their family budget was tight. One of the main causes of recurrent inner ear infections in children, and primarily during the winter months, is a lack of humidity in the home. During the winter, The average American household humidity is less than 12%, which is drier than Death Valley in the summer. Because of this very dry air, the mucous membranes of the mouth, pharynx, and sinuses become dried out, inflamed, and ripe for infection. Add to this situation a merry-go-round of antibiotics prescribed by pediatricians and ear, nose, and throat doctors, and you have a recipe for chronic, recurrent ear infections. 
I asked the couple what kind of heat they used in the home, and the answer was, a wood stove. I asked them what they did to humidify the air, and the answer was, a pot of water on the wood stove. I wrote out a recommendation for a home humidifier and a smaller humidifier for their son's room. They used the money that they saved on ENT visits, medication, and surgery to buy the humidifiers. Their son's recurrent ear infections stopped. Every year when the weather turns cold and the furnaces kick on, adults and children immediately begin to experience upper respiratory infections. This is largely due to a lack of humidity in the home. Those add-on humidifiers for furnaces? They don't work. By the time the air gets through the heating ducts and into a room, it has already dried out. Your body has a built-in monitor to measure humidity. It is called a nose. If the inside of your nose is dried out, sore, and or bleeding, your surrounding environment needs moisture. Another sure sign of a lack of humidity that can cause upper respiratory infections in the fall and winter is dry skin. When your skin is flaking off, your home needs moisture, and you need vitamin A and zinc in your diet. If you normalize your home's humidity levels, you will stay healthy and eliminate the need for doctor's visits and medications. I have been very blessed in my training and practice over the last 50 years. I had the good fortune to meet and train with practitioners of natural and herbal medicine who either went to school or practiced in the late 1800s. I have also learned a great deal from patients who bring me interesting and at times challenging cases that push the boundaries of my knowledge and abilities. I have been a member of the Baha'i Faith for over 50 years, and the Baha'i Faith's guidance on healing with food and herbs has guided my practice of medicine. This knowledge and ability has greatly benefited my patients. This has been another in a series of podcasts based upon lectures from the Blue Heron Academy. I hope that you enjoyed this podcast and will return for more of our upcoming presentations. Thank you for your kind attention, and stay healthy.